Tennessee walking horses are beautiful. They rank among the world's most gifted, well-tempered, and uniquely gated horse breeds. And today's guest is arguably more passionate, knowledgeable about, and protective of these magnificent creatures than anyone else. Marty Irby's world blew apart at age six when his father left to live with another man. Public ridicule forced a retreat to the riding rink where he ultimately became an eight-time world champion. And when he helped expose horribly cruel soaring techniques used to exaggerate the Tennessee Walker high step big lick, Marty's world blew apart a second time. Again, he prevailed. He's now one of the most influential champions and protectors of all animals, voted a top 10 lobbyist in DC, and officially recognized by none other than the Queen of England for his work with horses. Marty's originally from Mobile, Alabama, but he's visiting with us today from Washington, DC. We sat down for an interview in our Aliquot Animal Refuge podcast studio in Freeport, Florida. I grew up also in the horse world, but totally different than you. I grew up in the rodeo world, so I was a barrel racer and, you know, a little rough and tough cowgirl, right? And we had a little rodeo of our own yesterday, didn't we? It was great to get out on a couple of our rescued horses and ride next to the eight-time world champion equestrian, past president of the Tennessee Walking Horse Breeders and Exhibitors Association, and is a former communications director in Congress and has worked for many years in collaboration with Monty Roberts, the man who listens to horses. Let them go! Hey, Joe! Let them go! Well, we have a rally out here in front of the White House in Washington, D.C. today. We're trying to stop the Bureau of Land Management from rounding up our iconic Anarchy wild horses in Utah. Marty has helped secure six major new animal protection laws in the past four years. I've had the honor and pleasure of working with Marty at Animal Wellness Action, where he's the executive director. Welcome, Marty, to the Animal Passion Podcast. We, Animal Wellness Action, are a 501c4 nonprofit and political action committee, and we have donors uh, who range from uh, liberal Democrats in California to conservative Republicans in North Carolina that work together with us to effectuate change through advancing policy on the federal and state and even sometimes local levels. And before I got involved in all of this, I remember thinking, well, they need to do this or they need to do that. And, you know, there is no they. I mean, it's people like me. It's people like you. It's people that have dedicated time and effort and the patience it takes to get something like this passed. I get comments all the time about our passion. And I think, and I say this, that passion breeds success, especially in Washington, Mm -hmm. D.C., because there are so many issues that people are working on. It's something that um, is very special to me, like it is you, and that we care about and we love. And it's almost like you're, you're fighting or lobbying for your family when you're lobbying for animals. I knew I was doing the right thing, and, and God was behind me the whole way and continued to open doors. And I prayed about it, cried about it, screamed about it, yelled about it. I had moments where I literally was yelling at the sky at God and heard thunder, and then I figured I'd better back down. (laughs) If we did not have that passion, we would not be near as successful, and the evil side would win. That's the way I look at it. So we have to be. And it's definitely a calling, isn't it? It I mean, it's definitely what God, I feel like God put me on this earth to do this without a doubt. And and when you have that, I also feel like they put the right people in your path to help you and make you successful. My grandmother always said I should be a preacher and how I turned out as a lobbyist is is quite a different twist. I kind of look at it as when I was a kid, I had no friends and the kids at school used to always bully me and pick on me and the horses were my friends. I lived every day to go home and be with the horses and they saved me. So I feel, you know, now it's my turn to help save them. Can you briefly describe what it feels like to ride and what it looks like a Tennessee walking horse gait? Yes, well, the Tennessee Walking Horse actually has a very natural, inherent four-beat gait, and they're very smooth. You don't bounce like you would on a horse that trots or a horse that paces. They call it the glide ride, actually, and what some people do in the walking horse industry is they add certain devices and, unfortunately, a process called soaring, S-O-R-I-N-G, which is animal cruelty to accentuate that natural gait, to create an artificial pain-based high step known as the big lick, 
which is prized in the southeastern U.S., primarily Kentucky and Tennessee. Their feet naturally just pick up and, and their back feet just, like you said, glide along. I've actually seen people hold a glass of champagne on the back of one of those horses and it doesn't spill. <laughs> Yes, very much. I actually was third in the Water Glass World Championship one time on a Tennessee walking horse many years ago. They do have a long natural stride with their back legs, uh, which is what they call the stretch of the legs or a stride. They're just such graceful animals. And, you know, we've had many come through the refuge. Um, Some have been soared, some have not. But they just have such a gentle demeanor about them. And I think that is probably why they're such a subject of this abuse, correct? Oh, it is. They're a wonderful breed of horse. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've never been around horses that were more kind and gentle and quite honestly, as you said, easy to abuse because of that. You would never be able to soar a thoroughbred racehorse, Mm -hmm. uh, some quarter horses, because they would kick someone's brains out before they'd get that close to their feet with some chemicals. So Uh, It is unfortunate that they lend themselves to abuse because they have such a great disposition. Unscrupulous trainers actually apply caustic chemicals such as diesel fuel, kerosene, crotonol, mustard oil, and abrasive hand cleaners to the horse's front feet to make the skin sensitive so that it burns. And then they place a chain, an actual ankle chain, on top of that pastern and skin so that chain slaps the, the sword skin and causes the horse to step higher. They also use large stacked up shoes that are pads stacked up on top of each other, sometimes as tall as 10 or 12 inches in many instances, and those exacerbate the pain. Many times, uh, farriers actually cut the horses down to what they call the quick or the bloodline and nail hot nails into the hoof so that that creates pain. So what are the pro-storing groups? How do they advocate that this is okay for them to do to these animals? You know, they'll actually say they're against soaring and that they uh, believe that soaring is something that has either been a part of the past or is not nearly as rampant as what we say it is. I've seen it in every major training barn in the Tennessee walking horse industry, and I remember testifying in Congress. You know, one of the things that I've often described is I've seen horses' feet that look like pizza with the cheese pulled off that were burned so badly from the caustic chemicals uh, that soaring gone wrong. Obviously, they didn't intend for it to end up that way, but that is what can happen. And uh, a lot of these people are just in denial that soaring occurs. They've either been lied to by their trainers or they either turn the blind eye and act like they don't. But I will say in, in the past 18 to 24 months, I think more and more people in the Tennessee walking horse industry are coming to the table and realizing that, hey, soaring is is a lot more prevalent than what we thought it was and uh, we're seeing it firsthand these days. And I think I think that um, can also go for the number of people that attend these shows because here's a whole community that they even shut down the schools for at one time because these people wanted to attend this celebration where these horses perform for them. And now they say when you go to these shows that the audience is just, you know, it's from tens of thousands to maybe a thousand people or less. And so is that because do you think the awareness is out there? Or do you think the interest is no longer there or just a combination? Well, I think it's in part um, interest because the entire equine industry as a whole is definitely shrinking more so because of the soaring issue that people didn't know about it, didn't understand what it was. They just saw a pretty horse stepping eye and didn't understand. But now because of hearing that we had, I think in 2013, where I testified before Congress about soaring, that definitely had the most impact than anything else that's been done and brought awareness on the national stage through national news media. And we've kept our foot on the gas uh, with the press since then. The World Championship Horse Show had 30,000 people in the stands at one time and maybe has like eight or 9,000 on the last final World Grand Championship night. And uh, that's not a sustainable business model for them. Yeah, so that's a good thing for the horses. Yes, it's not making very money much. for the, the producers of the event. Yep. And for you, were you one day sitting on the back of a horse, galloping through a pasture, and decided you wanted to be the top lobbyist in the country and be recognized by the Queen of England? Well, no, actually, I say it uh, all sort of uh, was a little bit happenstance. Uh, I grew up in the Tennessee walking horse industry, showing and competing 
beginning at the age of four, and I competed for about 25 or 26 years until I was 30 years old. And I only stopped competing because I was elected as the president of the Tennessee Walking Horse Breeders and Exhibitors Association, which is the breed registry established in 1935 and had decided to run from the floor for that office the night before. So I had no plan and um, just felt that showing and competing further while I was president of the association was not something uh, that I should be doing. There was no rule against it, but I just felt I shouldn't be doing that if I was going to be leaving the association. So I intended to take a break from showing and, and serve in that role, and um, my life took a big turn. During the time that I was president of the Tennessee Walking Horse Breeders and Exhibitors Association, in 2012, the Humane Society of the United States, who I had been collaborating with behind the scenes, did an undercover expose of a horse trainer named Jackie McConnell brutally beating and torturing a Tennessee walking horse, multiple Tennessee walking horses, in order to get them to perform that big lit gate that we described and to keep them uh, where they actually could pass inspection. They, they steward them. They create pain in other areas of the horse so that they're not thinking about the pain in their feet. And they steward them to get them to pass federal inspectors. So during the time uh, that that occurred and while I was president, I had for many years been trying to change the industry from within. I saw it in the beginning more as a transition away from this archaic type of training or what they call training um, that may not within the industry be referred to abuse, but it is abuse. When that expose came out, I happened to be in Germany, Wimding, Germany, judging a horse show which had sound flat shot Tennessee walking horses. And to give you a little perspective, they don't even clip the whiskers of the horses in Germany. You wouldn't be allowed to do that, much less put something on a horse's foot that would be inappropriate or things like that. And I got to see the world's reaction to that expose while being in a foreign country which was quite an uproar. My phone was just blowing up, people calling right and left. Because you're in, you're in big danger at this point. Yeah. I mean, you know, we heard the story about the individual who was murdered years ago. George Lee Lennox, yes. Yes, he was and murdered. He was murdered because he tried to take a stand against this. So here you are on the cover of this newspaper, and you're in Tennessee at the time, correct? Yeah. yeah. And what did you do? What actually happened is when I agreed to go do the interview, I went to, to this uh, you know, friend's barn to do the interview, and my wife actually left while I was doing the interview. So I came home to a note that she had <gasps> left me, um, which was the greatest blessing of my life probably <laughs> at this point in time. But um, I came home to this note that she had gone after doing this interview, so I was like so distraught. Because you know, the rest she did of, the interview. Because she I did the interview. That you. was like the straw that broke the camel's back for Amazing. her. Amazing. I saw it as an opportunity to really make a lot of headway for the breed and the horses in a very short period of time. I said, you know, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. And I felt like God had put me there for a reason to be there and be that person during that time. I remember seeing that expose from HSUS where they showed the trainer beating the horse. I was not aware that you were even a part of that. But when you're working with them and you're, you're trying to get feed them information from behind the scenes, yet you're the face of the breed. Did you just keep it to yourself and you were working undercover? I mean, I'm really interested in how that went down. Yeah, no, I was definitely anxious, no question about that. It was definitely a secret, but there were a few people in the walking horse industry, a few others on the board with me when I was president that knew that. Our executive director at the time, who was uh, one of the old guard in the walking horse industry that wanted to change things too and really was a good friend to me, and then a couple of the um, past presidents of the Breed Association who had in the past before me made attempts to work with the Humane Society, but it was a tight-knit group, and I definitely got some good advice from those folks. We started trying to really get the industry to move away from these large stacked shoes and ankle chains that they place on the horse's feet that are legal today in the show ring, but they contribute to the soaring process and the horses that perform that big lick unnatural gait couldn't do it without those devices. I publicly came out in support of legislation introduced by two members of Congress, Ed Whitfield, a Republican from Kentucky, and Steve Cohen, a Democrat from Tennessee, the two states where we see the most soaring, called the Prevent All Soaring Tactics, or PAST Act. And that really uh, sent a lot of backlash my way. I didn't speak to my father for five and a half years after that. My wife and I were divorced. I basically had to file bankruptcy and lost my business because 
so much of what I was involved in was centered around the Tennessee walking horse. And then I was basically uh, looked at as an outcast at that point in time. And the congressman who had introduced the legislation, Ed Whitfield, as I said, asked me to come to Washington, D.C. and testify before the House of Representatives uh, about the past act and about soaring and what I had observed uh, throughout my whole life as a child, really, that I probably wasn't aware of until I was a teenager, but that I had seen and what happens and goes on in the industry. And then that led to uh, quite a bit more backlash. I actually had death threats uh, in writing. People that were dumb enough to put things in writing threatened <laughs> me. So I decided to make some of those people famous. And uh, a young lady by the name of Christina Wilkie was with the Huffington Post at the time. And she did a two-part series on the past act and my situation and my story. And one of the people who had made one of the threats against me she tracked him down and actually wrote him into the story and, you know, really displayed what was out there and also uh, really identified some of the political Republicans in Tennessee and Kentucky who were against the legislation that were supported by the pro-soaring coalition. Um, and I say all of that to say that's how I ended up in Washington, D.C. with these threats and these Huffington Post stories. And so Congressman Whitfield said, well, Marty said, you can't go back to Tennessee. You've lost everything, and you're probably going to be murdered if you go back. Why don't you just stay here and stay with me and my wife for a while until you get back on your feet? And uh, he said, I know how much you like Washington, D.C. and like politics. So I stayed with he and his wife, Connie. They're like my adopted parents now. Um, I say they took me in like a, a stray abused dog or something like that, kind of like what you do here at Aliqua. And uh, so I stayed with them for a month or two. And uh, the congressman had a position in his office come open. And I started working for him and was able to uh, secure that job, uh, moved up the ladder, became his press secretary and then communications director. But during that whole time I worked in Congress for him, I worked on animal protection issues and agriculture issues and uh, spent most of my time working on horse protection on Capitol Hill and brought light to the soaring issue. And then later doping in American horse racing, uh, horse slaughter with the SAFE Act and the wild horse issue. Then when the congressman was retiring, we all knew we had to go get a job somewhere <laughs> and uh, weren't going to be there very long. And uh, Wayne Pacelli recruited me to come work at the Humane Society at the time. I headed up their equine protection department and rural affairs and then was the primary Republican lobbyist for the Humane Society Legislative Fund. We left the Humane Society back in 2018 and started up Animal Wellness Action, where we've gotten to know each other and to work together, fortunately. And uh, so that's how I became a D.C. lobbyist and really enjoy being there in, in D.C. and what yeah. I do. Here you were, you were, you're literally raised on the back of a horse. You said you were three years old when you first started showing. Mm -hmm. This was your life. You grew up with these animals. When was that aha moment that made you go, I, I think there's something not right about what we're doing? As a child, I think probably through uh, about the age of 13, I really didn't notice or think much about it or uh, think anything of the shoes that were on the horse's feet. Uh, quite honestly, I can't really remember ever focusing on that, you know, when I was riding or looking at their feet that much. But when I was 13, my father, who was a horse trainer, actually taught me how to soar a Tennessee walking horse, this horse named High Tones Clown. And he was a white white footed horse the the hair around his feet mm -hmm. and his pastures was white and white footed horses have pink skin so mm -hmm. they tend to show irritation a little bit more and I remember my father teaching me how to soar the horse by placing as it's basically uh, a caustic chemical once you do certain things but gojo hand cleaner that you might wash your hands with or we see in a lot of mechanic shops is actually one of the primary chemicals that are utilized on the horse's feet for soaring and so he taught me to put this gojo on the horse's foot and wrap it with saran wrap and plastic and you know when you're thinking about a horse's foot and you're thinking about gojo and you're 13 years old it doesn't really register with you that that's what you're doing and of course as time went on uh, I learned more and more. He would take the horse up to inspection and have to put uh, desitin that they used to use on uh, babies that with diaper rash on the horse's foot so that the irritation would go away to, pay, to be able to pass inspection. As the years went by and into my teenage years, I learned more and more about other things. They used kerosene and things like that. That's when I guess I started feeling like something wasn't right. We're basically in 
in the rural South. And when I came in and I had the guns blazing, I was ready to make all this change. People said that there was no way it was going to happen. And the more I got into it, I realized that when you go in to talk to the sheriff or you go in to talk to the state attorney or you go in to talk to a lawmaker, they have these things called the crazy animal people files, you know, and yeah. and I was told you don't want to be in that file. You don't want your name in it because there are people who are so passionate about what we do, but sometimes they can do more harm than good. So can you speak to that? Oh, absolutely. I'd say there are three categories, you know, advocates, activists, and whacktivists. <laughs> and, you know, the advocates that come to D.C. and uh, before COVID, at least, did fly-ins and come in person, meet with their legislators, really know their stuff, really have the information down, have studied it, and understand the legislative process are the most helpful. And that really does make a difference when you have a face with a mission and an issue area behind it that's in your district that comes across as reasonable and, uh, you know, that doesn't seem too far right or left and more toward the center. And then you have the activists who are very passionate and do a lot of great work and come to Capitol Hill, but they probably overdo it sometimes. <laughs> and then you have the activists, and I think those are the people who are primarily on social media. And, you know, unfortunately, social media is what it is today, but I personally don't believe it plays near as big a role in getting bills passed in Congress as everyone else thinks that it does. Having been a comms director on Capitol Hill, I know that most of the members of Congress don't actually look at their own social media or really even come up with the tweets or the Facebook posts. It's when you write into that congressman and you send a letter or you make a phone call or you send an actual email that talks about what you want in the issue area that makes a difference. Social media, it looks glamorous and looks good and popular to some people, um, but uh, the, the activists are the ones who are just going crazy on Twitter all the time, and we've seen what Twitter's done to the world in recent months. So. Right. I just feel like it's important to, to mention to the listeners that these issues are bipartisan, and you have to work with both sides. And, you know, you have to realize it takes time. And a lot of times there is legislation that might be geared more toward messaging and driving corporate reforms like the Kangaroo Protection Act that we right. work on than actually getting signed into law. Because with that legislation, we're actually working to stop Nike and Adidas from using kangaroo skins on their shoes. And having a federal bill to drive that conversation is a key component of that campaign. And who knew? That was the first that were, and, and I'm involved in the organization that's doing that animal wellness action. And, and I never knew they were killing wild kangaroos to, to make soccer shoes. And so I think a lot of it is just education. It always makes a difference if you have a personal story to tell, mm -hmm. um, if you have you know some incident that occurred with an animal, um, some food safety issue that's tied to factory farming, whatever the case may be, uh, people remember that. And so it definitely has an even greater impact when you're dealing with something like that. I know when I worked in Congress, I will never forget that this lady came from the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center and her son had worked in a chicken processing plant Ugh. and died because he fell into the grinder and was ground up ah. and sent out as bone meal. Ah. And um, she talked about the change in his pocket, like the guy that was the manager gave her the change in his pocket. But just like that story, I will never forget. And I worked harder because of it. Because when you have a story like that, that you connect with yeah. a face or a name, you want to work harder yeah. for it. So I, I think that's important for people to realize too. Yeah, I do too. And you know, part of part of why I wanted to do this Animal Passion series was to, to bring awareness to the bigger picture. Aliqua Animal Refuge rescues all kinds of animals and we rescue horses sometimes that come straight off the track. There are tons of horses that end up in the slaughter pipeline. Now we don't eat horses in America, but they do eat horses in Canada and Mexico and China and Europe. And so we have so many horses that are just thrown away and discarded. It's unfortunate. We definitely see a decline in horse slaughter because of our efforts to maintain a de facto ban through the appropriations process where we defunded horse slaughter plant inspections, mm -hmm. but that's a year over year effort. Um, it's not permanent. Horse slaughter could be brought back to U.S. soil, and we need to see federal legislation like the Safeguard American Food Exports or other anti-horse slaughter legislation enacted to stop those horses from going to slaughter. Years ago, I actually helped. That was one of the things I lobbied for was to stop the horse slaughter 
in the United States. So we made it illegal for these plants to, to operate within the United States. But what they didn't do was to make it illegal for the horses to be collected here in the United States and shipped over the border for slaughter. And so that's what's happening now. And so in Louisiana and in Texas and all of these places where race horses end up or unwanted horses end up, they end up um, being sold to these kill pens that in turn put them on trucks and bust them across the border to Mexico. And in the north, they bust them across the border to Canada. And I know recently there was a great story about a horse that you rescued here at Aliquot. Well, her name is Cool Deal. And believe it or not, she has still not made it to the refuge. She was in such poor shape coming off the racetrack, ended up in a, the kill lot, headed for slaughter. And we intercepted this horse. We had some donors that actually purchased her away from the kill buyers. Um, when we finally got her, it was apparent that she had some kind of neck injury. So she is still at um, LSU vet school, still not able to be transported to us. So we have spent thousands of dollars on this animal that I've never even met yet. And why we did that, it, it was just so important to us to be able to introduce people to get up close and meet these animals. Uh, lots of people, in, especially in, in Florida, have never met a racehorse. So we wanted to bring this animal here, let her be a um, ambassador for her breed and, and allow people to see how important it is for us to do this work to save these animals. What's your favorite animal? Horses. Who's the person you admire the most? Other than me, of course. No. <laughs> Lori <joking>. Hood. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Do you remember your first pet? Yes. Uh, well, aside from the horses, I had a, a wonderful dog named Snippy. Snippy. How many um, pets or horses do you own now? Just have one, a rescue King Charles Cavalier named Spencer, and uh, he's amazing. I, I love him more than life itself. Do you remember the inscription in your high school yearbook? Yeah, it was uh, Waylon Jennings, the Dukes of Hazard. Just the good old boys, never meaning no harm, beats all you ever saw, been in trouble with the law since the day they was born. That's the best one. What's the best name, like Spot, Silver, or Bojangles, you've ever heard for a horse or a pet? Hi ho, silver. What was your scariest moment around animals? Um, having been kicked in the chest by a horse with both back feet, um, oh. and uh, as a result, I had big two horse-shaped bruises <gasps> right here, oh, um, no. right here as a teenager. So. Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah. Did it knock the wind out of it? It did. It did. Yes, I definitely. Um, I I did not stand behind the horse for a very long time after that, yeah. and even to this day. I definitely stay off to the side if you're braiding a tail or whatever the case may be. That yeah, yeah. that okay. was a turning point for me standing behind horses. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's scary. Did, was he spooked? I don't know. I'm not sure what really just, caused it. I remember just, I was braiding his tail, and, and he just wow. you know, went backwards. So. Goodness. Okay. Are there decent politicians who care to work hard for animals? Oh, absolutely. There are great politicians on both sides of the aisle. You know, two people that come to mind right off the bat – uh, Congressman Brian Fitzpatrick, who's a Republican from Pennsylvania, is a 100 score on all of our animal issues in Congress. And then I'd say we have, you know, a tireless champion in Congressman Steve Cohen, uh, who's from Memphis, Tennessee, as well as Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, a Democrat from outside of Chicago, Illinois. So we have some great people in Congress that we work with together and are so fortunate to have. Has there ever been a time in your career where you think, uh-oh, I've gone too far? No, I don't think there has been. I like pushing the envelope, and I, if anything, even when others think I've pushed too far, I probably don't think I've pushed enough. Yeah. So not yet, but anything can happen. <laughs> <laughs> so what keeps you going, Marty? What's your, what, what gets you up every morning? Well, I say this. I have gone to sleep every single night of my life and woken up every single morning of my life thinking about horses since I can remember. So, you know, the horses are what keep me going at some point in the day, regardless of whether I'm working on, you know, big cats or sharks or whatever the case may be. I spend a good portion of that day working on the horses and, um, it's, it's in my blood. It's just a part of me. And that definitely fuels, uh, the majority of what I do. There's animal heroes of all kinds. There's people that are on the ground, like the people that we work with through Aliqua, 
and you know we're physically handling these animals every day and making a difference for them but then there's somebody like you that is working tirelessly to help millions of animals it's not just one it's not just two it's not even a thousand and I think it's important for our, our listeners to, to applaud you because it's people like you that make the difference and make the world a better place for animals. So I truly thank you for that. No, well, thank you. I just, I follow in your footsteps. I think the only person I know who can do more than me is you. So I'm, <laughs> I never cease to amaze when you have something new on your plate and you're inspiring to people like me, Lori, to keep us going. Well, thank you. 